Kia ora everyone, I'm Dr. Michelle Dickinson from NanoGirl Labs. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us all lots about science over the last couple of years. But with things like mask wearing and social distancing rules starting to relax, maybe it's time we start talking about the science of ventilating our indoor spaces, like our classrooms. I'm here at Richard Road School in Auckland to answer some of the questions we've had from teachers, parents and students about what we can do to help keep our classrooms safer. We're going to do some science experiments, but first of all, hi everyone! Hi, hi, hi Nana girl. girl! Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so we know that COVID is spread through the air and coming into winter, I'm worried about cold and flu spreading too. What can I do to make my classroom safer for my students and I? That's such a great question. And I think we're going to need to run a science experiment to find out. But first, I'm going to need some science helpers. Hi, my name is Coco. Hi, my name's Tony. Hey, I'm Martin. Hi, I'm Tia. And who wants the science? Me! So here we have an empty classroom, which is perfect for our experiment. This device measures different elements, such as temperature and carbon dioxide. I'm going to need help putting these all inside this classroom. Who wants to help? Me! For this experiment, we'll be rigging monitors and cameras in an empty classroom with all of the doors and windows closed so that we can monitor the levels without any students breathing inside. This will give us our baseline measurement. Now that we're back in our NanoGirl lab, let's take a look at the readings from our devices. We're going to start with temperature. 21.1 degrees Celsius inside. And 19 degrees Celsius outside. That's a two degree temperature differential. Next, we're going to look at carbon dioxide measurement. What does that say? 466 ppm. Mm -hmm. What does ppm mean? PPM stands for parts per million. And naturally outside, carbon dioxide levels are around 450 ppm. So the higher the carbon dioxide levels in a room, the more trapped breath that's in there. Oh, and then maybe the more trapped germs that are in there too. Yeah. Now the first part of this test is to see what happens in this classroom when all the windows and doors are closed. And then we put some bodies in there. I bet it'll be really warm in there with all the bodies in it. I think it's gonna get really hot. Probably all the students are sharing germs like COVID or even the flu. I think the carbon dioxide levels are gonna go up too. That's a great hypothesis. And it's actually something we can measure if we keep an eye on the temperature measurements. Now we know that this room started at 466 ppm of carbon dioxide. And as long as this number remains below 800 ppm, then we can be reassured that the room is really well ventilated and the risk of spreading COVID is much lower. It is a bit boring watching people breathe out invisible air. I wish we could actually see it. You're right, it is a bit boring. Now, luckily, I've got a really cool science friend. He works at NIWA. His name is Dr. Ian Longley, and he has these really cool cameras that can measure CO2 that you can visually see coming out of somebody's breath. Should we give him a call? Yeah. yeah. OK, here we go. Hi, Ian. Hi, Michelle. We're running some CO2 measurements in a classroom using some IoT sensors, but the students were wondering if there are other ways of measuring CO2. I've been working with Fisher & Paykel Healthcare with a special CO2 sensing camera. This camera allows us to see carbon dioxide as different colours. What you can see is how the breath comes out of our mouth and noses and how we can use this information to learn how not to breathe onto each other or how to get that breath out of the room. I still wish we could actually see people breathing. Well, we don't actually have those fancy cameras here, but we have the next best thing. First, I'm going to need some help engineering some of our experimental equipment. Let's start by building and painting some cardboard cutout students. Then we'll place them in the classroom and run some tubing connected to a haze machine to them so we can make the cutouts look like they have breath of vision. It looks like our cutouts are breathing. Uh huh. So now if we watch both of the rooms at the same time, we can visibly see the exhaled haze breath filling up the room, as well as watch the CO2 monitors measuring our actual students in a room and their exhaled breath. So who can remember what our background CO2 level was? 466 ppm. Very good. And let's take a look at what it is now. It keeps increasing. It was 836, then 1,253. And now it's 2,126. Isn't that real bad? You're right, it is super high. Remember how we talked about levels of 800 ppm or less showed great ventilation? Well, this shows us when we have a poorly ventilated room. Because all of the doors and windows are closed? 
Exactly. So levels measured between 1,251 and 2,000 ppm show us that we need to increase the ventilation in the room, let some airflow in to reduce our COVID risk. Ooh, get rid of all that stinky breath. Now, if there was a student in that classroom who was maybe infected with the virus like COVID, what do you think might happen? All the other students might breathe into the infected air and get sick too. So what do you think we need to do? Get rid of all the breath. Let's go open the windows. Oh, so what do you think is happening? I think the fresh air from outside is coming in and replacing the stagnant air. That's a really good hypothesis, which also means the germs will be flying out of the window too. And we can measure that by looking at the CO2 levels that you can see are going down. So hopefully that helps to answer your question with a really super simple solution. That's really helpful and free. Thanks heaps. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah, opening the windows on the North Island might be all right, but what about here in Ōtautahi? So usually it's too cold here and my students will be freezing. That is a great point. Can you just help us with some data? Do you know what the temperature was this morning in Christchurch? Well, it was four degrees this morning and my friend in Invercargill said it was minus four degrees down there. Right, minus four it is. It's time to build the Invercargill Environmental Simulation Lab. Bring in the truck! So, what do you think? It's freezing in here! It is, it's minus four degrees centigrade freezing. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna engineer a solution to take this freezing cold truck and connect it to our classroom. So we can do a simulation of what some of our South Island classrooms might be experiencing. So who wants to help engineer a solution? Yay! We need to create a seal between the freezer truck and the classroom window to simulate the outside temperature you might find in chilly Invercargill. That great job, team. Okay, why don't we head back to the lab and talk to Ian about our next experiment. Dr. Ian, in our last experiment, we got rid of the carbon dioxide and germy breath by opening the windows. But what if it's cold outside? So our research shows that the colder out it is outside, the less you actually have to open your windows to get the same cleaning effect. And if we open the window less, it won't be as cold inside. Exactly. Our calculations show that if you open your windows by maybe the length of your thumb, say five, five or six centimeters or so, and that will give you the same cleaning effects, but will stop loss of so much heat. Cool, thanks Ian. Right, you know how this works. First, we're gonna need our baseline temperature measurements. Let's have a look at our sensors. Well, it's 20 degrees Celsius inside the classroom and it's minus four degrees Celsius outside. Ooh, that's a 24 degree temperature differential. Now what we're gonna do is fill up the room with our hazy breath again. So who's gonna open the window? Me, I will. For that, you'll need to measure your thumb. Five centimeters. Got it. Look, the vapor's pouring out just like four. Well, that's because the larger the temperature differential between the outside and the inside, the faster the air is gonna be drawn out. Let's take a reading from these devices. Look, the classroom temperature has already dropped by two degrees. Which shows that even when it's cold outside, opening the windows doesn't lower the classroom temperature by very much. So in winter, you only need to open the windows a small amount and less often to get great ventilation, which will keep your students safe and warmer. Hey, that's really helpful. Thanks, team. Does anybody else have any questions? I've been using an air filter in my classroom. Aren't they better than opening a window? Well, because air filters don't actually filter carbon dioxide, we can't use our previous haze machine test. But what we can do is use computer modeling to show you what happens when an air filter is put inside a classroom. Air filters work by filtering and recirculating the same air that is already in a room. Using mathematical modeling of airflow, we can see how the air moves around the air filter as well as how air moves with the open windows. It's great at filtering out the air close to where the air filter is placed, but that effectiveness decreases the further away you are from the air filters, whereas the open window technique helps to ventilate the whole room. Now, many other countries will use filters in all of their classrooms, but here in Aotearoa, we have the best air quality. We're really lucky, which is why opening our windows works really well. Well, I love gadgets and gizmos. Here in New Zealand, our experiments and the research really seems to show that the simple solution of just opening the windows is the best. Yay!
<laughs> okay, that wraps our experiments for today and hopefully answers some questions. But hold on, where's Tony? Hey guys, look what I found in the freezer truck. Ice cream? Who wants one? Me! Me. Ah. <laughs>